so excited to be here with Peter. Um, thank you to the Slush organizers to bring us together. Always a pleasure. And Peter, I think we're now certified old, right, <laughs> after this introduction, um, talking about what Europe has traveled over the past few decades. Um, and I suppose it's our third downturn together. And it, it really took me down the memory lane when I took a venture class at business school over 20 years ago. The professor was American. The curriculum was American. The case studies were from Harvard. And the companies were from Silicon Valley. And look where we are now. And at, in those days, the kind of the European tech company was SAP. But actually, in the background, you were building Bibit. Yeah, Bibit is the... We already started that in 1997. And what we did is what many European founders do, and that is we sold way too early. Um, at the time, a billion was 100 million. When we could sell for 100 million, that's what we did. And uh, we were out. And financially, it worked out, but emotionally, it did not. We weren't done yet, but we just sold because, hey, uh, all the owners get a few million, and that sounds very attractive. And we didn't have many examples of companies that kept going. So it was the European thing to do. You have some money, you sell. Well, I guess there were no Peters and Adjians for you at the time. And we watched Bibit, I remember, from the outside. And after you had sold the company, you were definitely the team to go and back again. Even the name suggested that Adjian means for those who don't know, in a uh, South American dialect, a uh, Dutch dialect, it means all over again. And the, the, the first seven folks, the seven founders, were the same ones as Bibit. So from the outside, it looked like a no-brainer. But I guess maybe yeah, not from the inside. Yeah, it was different because after we sold, which, like I said, was financially successful, emotionally unsuccessful, um, we didn't think we would be back in payments. But then... We all went off to do our own things. I signed up for lockup for two years, worked for a large company for uh, RBS. Um, at a certain point, we regrouped. And then if you looked at how much things we still could do and what we learned, we thought, let's now get back in and really build the company as it should be built. And one of the things that, that actually resonated with me is if your company gets acquired by a large company, and you always hear the same stories, how the founders don't like it and how it's difficult. And um, that's exactly also what happened for us. RBS was a great company, but uh, they had multiple platforms. Everything became uh, locked because you cannot go to a new platform if everything that you're building from is still changing. So everything got frozen for years. All our customers were complaining. I was, of course, being difficult. And in those discussions, I got to remark, Peter, do you think that company that we bought, Bibit, do you think it was successful because of you or despite you? And they were sort of suggesting that obviously it was despite me. So when we came back, I thought, like, let's prove that point. That's an interesting challenge. Were we successful despite ourselves because just it was the right timing or because of ourselves? So there's a lot of... Um, I'm not a Formula One driver, but there was a lot of feel that let's put ourselves on the line again and see if we can win this and show even now that, it's a, that, that there are large payment companies show that it's skill. And we started in the worst times. We started in 2006 in the middle of a crisis. Yeah, I guess uh, entrepreneurship doesn't, doesn't, know, uh, doesn't pick a time, right? You saw an opportunity um, from what we saw the ambition had changed. Clearly, you had a bigger prize uh, in mind. But, but also, I would go further, I would say, if you did it at a different time or different place, maybe it wouldn't have worked. If, if you started this second company in Silicon Valley, maybe you would not be able to take a bunch of these really unorthodox steps. I, I mean, at the time, like stock options didn't exist in Europe. Um, but. Yeah, so the, it's funny you use the word price, but the price for us was to show the market that we could outsmart the other suppliers. The price was not a financial reward. The price was we built this very large company with a long-term view, and we made many decisions which took years to really benefit from, 
but that was all because our prize was we need to outperform, we need to beat, and we need to prove. Um, to have employees on board that share that mission, that want to put in a lot of work, which only gets rewarded at a later stage, for that we used the opportunity to buy at the last round that we were funded. So many employees in the beginning, say the first 20 employees, all put in some money, 5,000 euros, 10,000 euros, uh, what you could miss. We kept it at your salary to avoid that a rich uncle buys our company. So it was if you were earning 50K, you could buy up to 50K of stock. That program has been incredibly successful. And now my co-founder started a new company, uh, Tabby, and he's doing exactly the same. And the vast majority of the employees, again today, whereas there in between has been so much money around and where engineers could ask for, for stock options over and above salary, still they're buying into the company themselves with their own money. And that means that those employees are not are really becoming co-owners and that you really share the same mission. So that would be something, if, if you want to pick up something in this talk, consider that. Consider giving your opportunities, an opportunity to employees to be part of it, even if it's with a very, very small stake. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible story of winning mindset and, and getting uh, the ultimate level of buy-in um, from, from, your, from your colleagues, from your team, and ultimately the full commitment to go the whole way. How do you, I mean, in this case, how do you balance uh, loyalty versus excellence? You know, in, when, 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 when everybody becomes a shareholder, you know, how do these, I just wonder if I, if I were a fly on the wall, these tough conversations when, um, you know, this engineer you mentioned is an important shareholder and, and performance may not be there. Um, I think you should separate out the two. So if you, are, um, if you are a good lever, you get to keep the stock and you have to leave anyway. Uh, the stock were certified, so they didn't have any voting rights. So you avoid that, should there be, that somebody feels shortchanged, that he cannot ob obstruct future decision making in the company. So that's how we did it. Yeah. If you're a bad lever, we could reverse, and uh, we could reverse the stock transaction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's it, you know it it just underscores that you were determined, um, and that um, you just went for it. And for for the founders in the room, I suppose the the lesson is that the confidence that at least from the outside you were just determined to filter out the noise. And from what we've seen, you know, working together, there's never been any sort of zigzagging. You know, there's good times, there's bad times. The market has gone through cycles, but there's never been any drama. That's always what it's looked like from the outside. Um, we started in 2006. It took us five years to get to profitability. Um, but it also took us five years to, to see that it was actually working out. So with hindsight, it seems to you like, oh, you were determined and then you just worked it out and you were very <laughs> confident. That means that for years we didn't know if we would survive. Um, I remember the day that we had three co so we were the three of us, the founders. One of the co-founders went home and he said, I'm going to take a bath and I'm going to sit in the bath and I want to feel the water right till here because that's reality. And then I can not only visualize it, I can feel it. So it's not true that from day one, it's like, oh, rockstar team, easy. No, we had our rough uh, times. And, uh, but I think I consider us part of the cockroach generation. And it's not a term which I invented myself, but the cockroach companies are the ones which are running on very little money. We had our employees chipping in. Uh, we took very, very little money from, uh, uh, from the outside, could fund a little bit ourselves, but we weren't endlessly wealthy. And that's how we moved the company to a stage where we were profitable, where we felt that we had something to, uh, uh, a base to grow. And that's when we started to have discussions yeah. with you, when we felt that, okay, now we built something, but the resilience, how we built it was enormous. Yeah. 
And w w ever since we call it building something from nothing because you genuinely took very little capital and kind of fast forwarding to, to today, um, all the stats that get recited at conferences, you know, Europe has all these universities and engineers, all these great preconditions are here. But now I think the mindset is also one of confidence because it can be done. It can be done in times, similar times as now actually when you were starting, you can do things with very little if you sort of apply yourself to it uh, with, with, with um, actually a landscape that's clearer of competitors, right? Because, I mean, let's look at the last five years. Most, most of the business plans that were put forward got funded, and, and, and I've heard of you many times how, um, how you thought that was unhealthy. It's unhealthy, and it's for a good company difficult to compete if, if in your market bad companies, so companies which ultimately will not survive, get funded because they compete for talent, maybe they, they underprice the market. Um, so it creates an, an irrational environment in which you as a rational operator need to win. So it also creates a lot of confusion. And in an, in an era where the, the economical laws are again respected and you need to have a path to profitability, um, where you need to pay people a sensible salary, which can, you can sustain for years. And you don't just think like, oh, it's a hack for something because I'm going to exit this in a short time anyway, and then somebody else can uh, solve the problems. It's good. That, I think it's good for great companies because this is a window in which you can show quality and not the whole vision is blurred because there's so much going on. Yeah, but Peter, now I put it back on you because you, you, you say, oh, it looks different from the outside, but from the outside, it, it does look like AGN is the sea of stability and, you know, you retain the people that you want to retain and you don't, oh, you don't go over hiring and, you know, over swinging in, in, you know, in the previous bull market. I mean, I mean do, do share a little bit, like on, on the inside, pressures dealing with, with all these demands and, um, you know, a yeah. lot, of, lot of competitors for, for your talent. Um, but there's a point where you have to realize that you get yelled at sooner or later. So when in our market at a certain point, it was all the mobile uh, payments on, uh, uh, on small devices. And we were servicing corporate merchants where it was less relevant. So investors will say you should do something else. There is a time that, that there were crazy salaries, uh, um, to my view, for engineers. I think engineers are huge contributors to what we built. We gave them the opportunity to, to buy into, and many of them came out very, very well. Um, but I think it's unfair to pay somebody a salary where you know it's not sustainable. So we stayed away from that. So when we had growth plans, we couldn't hire the number of people we wanted to, but we've hired them the last two years. Uh, so we were buying the dip also in terms of expanding the company. Uh, we have some great people joining us in the last 18 months. The, the timing was much better. So that worked out for us. So therefore, yes, it looks like stability. It was also planned because um, planned in the sense that so then apparently we grow a bit slower in number of people in those years when everything was, uh, was under pressure. And that gives us the opportunity now to onboard very talented people. Yeah. So it, but it feels very counterintuitive and some investors are shocked by it that when everybody's laying off people, we think like, oh, this is the moment to, to get some quality people on board. Great. Yeah, great. I mean, you definitely are projecting confidence. And, and I think that's what's, that's what's needed because historically there's been this stereotype that Europe is the sort of the... Uh, the poor cousin and, you know, a certain investor has compared Europe to a museum and a holiday place. And it's just no longer true. Um, we're seeing great companies and I know you mentor or uh, here and there come across and spend time with young entrepreneurs. We certainly haven't felt that in the last year there's been a decrease in appetite. If anything, this gives entrepreneurs the confidence uh, to start global companies from, from out of Europe. We had so few, um, so few examples of European companies that kept on going. It's a very small group. 
like nobody, I think in this audience, very few people realize that Booking used to be a European company. Uh, but I think it's about 2009 when they sold for 135 million to Priceline. Because that's what you used to do. And now I see way more examples of entrepreneurs that keep going. And I think and I hope that's inspiring others to not sell out too quickly and to really build something impressive. But this must be cultural, right? I mean, looking at that time distance we, we've covered, I mean, those 20 years you mentioned since mid-90s, since BBIT, I mean, that is a change of attitude or is there, is there anything else that you think is under the hood? Um, well, I'm European myself, so I understand the view like you don't need unnecessary money uh, and there is, is it like a hard drug? Do you always need more or is there, is there a point? But then you're missing the pleasure that you get out of building a very large company and proving how good you are and what with talented people you can accomplish. It's not about the, the financial accomplishment and I think that's a confusion um, that maybe also uh, we ourselves made the first time around, although I was against the sale, but it's like, okay, financially very productive. At a certain point, you realize, like, no, but that's, that's not... The ultimate goal is to prove how great of a company you can build. And yes, it is inspiring to see others around you do that. We, all those CEOs tend to know each other and see others also taking it way, way further. Um, so I hope that it becomes easier for Europeans to do that. We list it in Europe. We really prove that there's a European ecosystem that works. Yeah, I mean, that's beautifully said. I mean, myself... Obviously, as a European, I feel similarly. We, of course, we invest in, in the US and have a big operation there. But, um, you know, having had the opportunity to move there, I think the diversity of companies and the types of businesses that um, get born here probably wouldn't be elsewhere and definitely feel confident about the future. And I would for sure uh, say that today is the time that's going to separate the bold and the tentative. Uh, there's definitely a number of business plans in, in, in sectors that um, you, may say, you may say are crowded or somebody's done it before, but I guess you went into a space with, you know, there were dozens of payment processors, right? And you just see the opportunity that, that had presented itself to, to pull away from the pack. I'm very, very positive about the current environment in Europe for entrepreneurs, even though you could say there's less money around. I don't think that, sh that, I think that's also an opportunity for the good companies. There's one trend which I dislike, which is um, local governments, so national governments gold plating European rules. Because we need the European market, like the US has a large domestic market, we need Europe to be sort of a large domestic market. And if there are different rules in each country, and you see that, national governments have the tendency to say, oh, that rule is good, but we're going to make it even better, which is called gold plating. That doesn't help because then it doesn't scale so nice and we should allow ourselves an internal European market. So um, that's the only trend which I think uh, could help if we don't do that. Uh, but other than that, I'm extremely positive about our current state. Yeah, I, I tell you, uh, life is hard enough with you know, the difficulty of posting uh, my parents a parcel from the UK uh, to Europe after Brexit. So I, I echo the le le let's not interfere anymore because there's <laughs> too much <laughs> interference already. I think we, we, we don't have too much time. I think we should look in the future and, and sort of, um, you know, reflect on if there's, if there's anything we could do. We, what, what, from our perspective at Index, certainly, the huge, the, 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 the two huge leaps that have happened has been one, the confidence, and second, role models. And the involvement of those who've already been in either successful startups or have seen startups, actually they give back to the community and, 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 and get involved. I'm curious how you look at that. I think it also helped. We never used the money that you gave us because we were already profitable. So first that was, more a war chest showing confidence to our merchants that this is a stable company. That's what we used it for. We never spend it. But we also used a little bit for secondaries. 
So because we knew we were going to run a long time as a private company and we want to give people a little bit back. How do you look at secondaries? Because I think that helped us to go very far because people were also financially feeling some of the success. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great point you raised. I mean, in the past, back to your example with booking and many others, you know, selling had some sort of a negative connotation. It was like, I'm quitting. And actually, where I come back to the change in mindset and the kind of the shifting of gears and more confidence, actually what it's about is what are the preconditions? What can we do to, to actually raise ambition, to raise the bar, to keep going? And in some senses, as, as you've done at Adyen, is to allow people to take more risk as they go over time and very carefully thought through and measured secondaries have allowed that in a, in a really constructive way. And, and I guess your retention uh, ha has actually proved that, that people were able to take risk off the table and stayed for yeah, significantly then, above Then average. we can run it as entrepreneurs rather than a pension plan for our children. Yeah, yeah. And after all, if you need money, you can go to the bank. But, but it's, it's about building a world-class company. And with that, I think we're being pushed off the stage. So well, um, cheers to more European successes and congratulation on, um, congratulations on building Adyen to what it is. Thank you.